Hello everyone, how are you doing? I guess we're all doing the best we can uh, under the circumstances. Let me just uh, warn you that uh, as we talk, you could hear the wind, even though the microphone is well protected, but uh, at the moment it's a bit windy around this part of the world. I mean, the Costa Brava, uh, which is north of Barcelona and south of France, if you like. You could hear seagulls. <laughs> They are getting much more comfortable uh, and confident coming into uh, the part of the world where the humans were until recently. So they, they're just uh, conquering a little bit this area. And you may see, or maybe not see, but I'll tell you that actually wild boars <laughs> are being seen in some of the roads as well. Imagine in this area, which is next, is about... 10-15 uh, kilometers from the mountains uh, they are looking for food I imagine and they just again feel comfortable uh, walking the streets that used to be full of humans but not so much anymore so uh, one of the one of the few funny things that are happening here but anyway I got you questions for Ask Guillem and I'm, I'm actually enjoying doing this because the questions are so good and I won't be able to answer them all but I'm going to pick uh, uh, as many as I can today. Uh, starting with Paul Campbell, who does uh, obviously a very interesting question. What is the most likely outcome of La Liga? I personally backed Espanyol after the signing of Raul de Tomás to get out of the relegation zone, and they still had time and quality to do so. Surely it's not fair they relegated without being given the chance. Uh, La Liga and the Federation, which have been had so many crashes between them, clashes, uh, they are thinking the same way here, which is that they want the season to finish. Now, they have to, in a way, they have the responsibility as part of the show business that they are, as well as sport, uh, of giving hope to people, the hope that uh, football can come back. And they uh, keep putting forward ideas towards that, including, for instance, what it will look like when, uh, when the season uh, gets reinstated, La Liga has got already a plan to have um, 11 uh, hotels and areas in Spain where the clubs will be, uh, will be resting and staying, almost like a, as if it was a World Cup. There will be games, they think, behind closed doors. I think that's something that everybody across Europe agrees on. The, there won't be uh, fans watching those games, but there will be the possibility of broadcasting them maybe every day. So all that has been planned, including... What happens if in that mini World Cup, if you like, uh, 11 uh, games in the case of La Liga take place? What happens if uh, one of the players, even though there will be all kinds of tests uh, three days before they meet uh, to do the preseason, three days before the start of the season, uh, etc. What happens if one uh, is positive for coronavirus, even though there will be those teams will be isolated from the world, if you like? And the plan is to isolate the player, then the test to test very quickly the, 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 the rest of the squad. And I just see the whole thing so complicated. I, th I think that everybody's uh, realizing that uh, the summer is coming very quickly. The, uh, the end of isolation in Spain hasn't, uh, hasn't finished. Uh, it's been given an extension. It probably will have another extension. I expect it to go on well into May, and then little by little, we'll come back five, six weeks to some kind of normality, but it won't be normality, not for a long while, because we just don't know what happens when more people go into the streets, um, when the those that are asymptomatic uh, mix with others, and how to stop that happening. We haven't got all the solutions. And more and more, I'm starting to think that the uh, the league will probably be cancelled. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, then they will have to uh, propose new ideas of what to do, including, for instance, uh, the suggestion has been off the record that perhaps they could uh, push up uh, the two teams that are top of uh, the second division and then no relegations. But then by the 3rd of August or the beginning of August, uh, La Liga, the Federation will have to tell UEFA which teams will go into Europe. That'll already, that will have to be decided, perhaps based on the position of the teams. So all in all, it's not clear what's going to happen. Nobody has got the solution. But as I say, La Liga and the Federation are, are 
wanting to put the best scenario possible in front of our eyes. Ben is asking, will Lacazette join Atletico Madrid? Atletico Madrid don't have money. They, they, don't, uh, they uh, 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 joined the uh, government uh, scheme by which uh, government will pay some of the wages of the non-players anyway. They are at the limit uh, of, of the money situation and they will go for players who are free. What's going to happen in the transfer market, uh, let me explain quickly, is that uh, there won't be massive transfer fees, not for a long while, not for two, three, four years. At some point, it may happen. It, it may all start when Real Madrid decides to go for Mbappé, um, perhaps uh, next summer. If that's the case, they will have to make a big payment because it will be a year before uh, his contract ends. Uh, and that may just reinvigorate the, the market. But in any case, nobody expects the next market, which could last a long time, uh, FIFA may just give the opportunity to for teams to, uh, perhaps even until January, certainly uh, for a long time, and depending what happens with the league, of course. Uh, but it will be an exchange of players. That will be the favourite uh, position of the clubs. Clubs will go into the friendly clubs, those are that are close to, and uh, try to find solutions. Exchange of players that help them get better, uh, give new illusion, we say in, in Spain, new uh, excitement to the fans and the media, uh, and uh, add uh, competitiveness to the side as well. All that is the target. And, you know, for the, in the case of Barcelona, they're friendly with, uh, with Manchester United, with Juventus, with Inter, and that's where teams would like to, and are having conversations about the possibility of swapping players. Perhaps sometimes with adding money. For instance, the plan for Barcelona would be to get Neymar if they could and send Griezmann the other way, plus money. I just don't think they have a lot of money available, though. So uh, I, for these kind of big ones, which I think are going to be very, very, very unlikely this summer, uh, it will have to be, uh, you know, you have to be a lot of conversations. And at the moment, PSG are not talking to Barcelona. They're not one of the friendly uh, teams. So we're going to have to um, to keep an eye on these situations, but that's what the the, um, the 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 favorite position of the big clubs are. Ben also asking: Should football adopt stricter measures such as salary and transfer cap? The problem with that is that um, there is there is enough rules and laws that make that impossible. Uh, you'll have to change the laws, the civil laws, before you actually introduce that into football. So I don't think that's a priority right now. But it's a warning sign to everyone that when football has stopped for, say, two months, that uh, most clubs in the Premier League, in Serie A, in, in France, in Germany, in Spain, most clubs want to be backed by the government and go into those schemes in which they get a percentage of the wages of some of their uh, non-staff uh, or, or, and demand also and ask the players to get a, a wage cut. When that happens, and so quickly, it means that obviously two months of not bringing money in is a, is a huge disadvantage. Plus, with no football happening, and this is important, that's why the leagues want to, it to continue, with no football happening, there are payments that televisions have to make that they won't make. For instance, in Spain, they paid until the 31st of May. But they still got to pay at the end of the season a 25%, 25% of, um, of broadcast rights. That goes domestic and internationally. Without that happening, without that money, uh, yes, where do you get the money to pay for players? Just briefly, again, um, basically the situation in Spain in regards of what they're going to get from the players is that they do want to reduce their wages. But... At the moment, they say they are working, they are training. So why would they have to be reduced of the wages now when they are working? So if football doesn't return, that's the, what they would like to do. If it doesn't return, they're willing to pay 10, 20%. If football comes back, they don't want to pay anything from their own wages to the clubs, to help the clubs, because they think that uh, they are doing that job. I think they will arrive to an agreement, but certainly it won't be the 30% that uh, the Premier League uh, and the players have agreed to pay. Now that this agreement is how to pay that money, if you're going to the NHS or having to go to the, to the clubs. So as you can see, very complex situations. Also, add another one. A lot of players finish the contracts the 30th of June, but I know that FIFA will, will allow 
clubs to extend contracts until the end of the season, if the season ends. So Besco Trajovic, who is a regular here, says, would Barcelona really, really sacrifice Griezmann to bring back Neymar? Yes, they would. Uh, but as I say, uh, this is a, a, such a strange situation right now that is, this doesn't seem to me there's going to be massive, massive deals happening. So even though this Neymar, Griezmann would have been a possibility if in normal circumstances, right now, I don't think it's a priority at all. Uh, and I, I think it's too complex for it to happen. That's the feeling that I got having spoken to people at, at both clubs. Nani Dean says, as a fan, the thought of finishing the season behind closed doors is aberrant to me and 80% of fan base. It's merely putting money before everything else and football would shoot itself in the foot if they attempted. What are your thoughts? Right, I, I can see from, the, from both angles. Of course, uh, football without the fans is nothing. We did a, a podcast uh, about the coronavirus with uh, Stuart Weber, with Pep Clotet, with Lauren, and, uh, and we were discussing the fact that without fans, football is nothing. And they were saying it themselves as director of football. Uh, Carlos Carvajal was there as well. And they all agreed that that was the case. Now, um, the problem is you need to play to get the money from the broadcasters that allow you clubs to actually have a, a sound financial situation for next season. So it's not the best case scenario, but it's the one that uh, has to happen because no vaccine will arrive before the summer. And if football is going to take place, it will have to be taking place during the summer. So you have to understand that as well. Masson says, can we have an episode all about Pep's football philosophy or the psychological side of the game? That's the kind of uh, thing that you'll find on, uh, on my podcast. There's a lot on, on sports psychology. <clears throat> There's a lot on Pep, Guardiola and Cruyff. Uh, I think you will you will really enjoy it. Perhaps I should prepare one related to um, to the book I did with him, uh, another way of winning. Uh, maybe a, a podcast that uh, looks back or or at least tries to analyze what Pep Guardiola's football is about and and why has it been so special to us. But that's where you'll find it in the in the podcast. Trust and obey says uh, United and Chelsea who's likely to get Sancho. Uh, the story I had before it all went bad with coronavirus is that Sancho was not for sale, not yet. But uh, I know the things have changed. And if there are clubs that can actually uh, make a deal, uh, one important deal, that you'll find them in the Premier League. So I know that uh, both uh, Chelsea and Manchester United will, will like to reinforce their, their uh, squads. The problem is the cost of Sancho. We're talking about 70, 80 million euros at least, possibly much more. Uh, Borussia Dortmund hasn't put a price to him, but easily he, they could say 100 and odd million, not a problem. And I don't think anybody will make that kind of sacrifice right now. So if Borussia Dortmund demands that kind of money and they're willing to sell, I don't think they will for 100 million. So it is amongst both of them. I think Manchester United are ahead of, of Chelsea to get Sancho. Uh, because it does look like that plan they had to actually uh, reinvigorate the side, get young players, developing them and get them better, seems to be at, or was going at, at a decent pace. Uh, perhaps not as quick as many fans will like, but certainly the plan continues. Solskjaer will be there next season, so uh, it will be another opportunity for young players to come in and be given chances and minutes. In the case of Sancho, will go straight into the team, of course. The problem for me is the fee. I think it's too much money. How serious is this Chelsea signing of Coutinho, according to Camps 3, Bright? Uh, and the thing is, only Leicester has shown interest in Coutinho. Only Leicester. But I know that his representatives, Coutinho's representatives, are looking into the Premier League with the possibility of getting him. Uh, a disclaimer, but I think I did that already. But uh, yes, yeah, Spurs wanted him. It's been published that... Uh, yeah, I think I did that last week. But anyway, I'll, I'll continue. Uh, it's been published that, that basically Pochettino didn't want him and it wasn't like that at all. Uh, it was that right at the last few minutes when things had been advanced and there was money uh, being mentioned, uh, Daniel Levy decided to uh, change the deal that had been uh, negotiated for a much shorter deal as he likes to do and that broke the, the conversations. A very interesting one from Dan Nolan. Uh, which is asking, 
which Premier League manager team is best placed to deal with the new, more than likely restricted financial environment post-COVID-19? I'm thinking Liverpool club, good, but Spurs Mourinho will struggle. What a good, what a good angle. Uh, and I hadn't thought about it until I saw the question. And that's absolutely crucial. Uh, it, the squads will be very similar to what they've got now. And you have to look at what squads have got the possibility of uh, room for improvement. I completely agree with you about Spurs. I agree with you about, about Klopp. Uh, I, I thought I knew that City wanted, for instance, to uh, make about four changes to the lineup, and all that has slowed down big time. Uh, there is less room for manoeuvre, even though there are players that can get better than that this season for sure. But it's the kind of relationship that Pep has got with the players that demands new blood coming in and new, um, new players. Well, that perhaps won't happen unless there is those swaps that we're talking about. So it puts City in a difficult situa situation. Also, I think uh, if the leagues return now, the physicality of the teams will be important. How quickly they adapt to uh, uh, to be quick, to be to be strong, uh, and and that you will have to look at Liverpool as well. Uh, if there was an European uh, competition being played, Champions League and Europa League, you know the UEFA are actually pushing that to one side because they're feeling that uh, the leagues, the domestic leagues, have got priority. Well, again, Liverpool in Europe will have a, a certain advantage. They they have that ability to. Um, to use pace and physicality to a level that not many you find in Europe, in Europe are able to do. Oh, Saurav is saying, thoughts on Arteta's short tenure so far, and do you have any Arteta stories to share? Loads of Arteta stories. Loads. Uh, my favorite one related to Arsenal. Uh, by the way, I think that he's found himself a squad that's limited, and Arsenal will struggle unless they just get new players coming in again. And I'm not sure... The value of the squad will allow them to go into the market with swaps of, of the quality that Arsenal requires. So we'll see on that. But uh, I, I th I'm convinced that uh, Arsenal is in very, very good hands and uh, they will improve. We'll have to think how this, even if the leagues stop, how does it affect teams? We'll have to have a, th a big think about it. But I think we've given few clues. One of them is the, the ability to swap players. And I think, uh, as I say, Arsenal may struggle with that. But in terms of stories, um, he came in, he was signed by Arsenal uh, and went to play the first game about a few days after he arrived. Was it Sunderland? It was nil-nil at, uh, at halftime and he had seen and sensed that it was a very quiet changing room and basically that there weren't many leaders. So he took upon himself to um, the, 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 gave a step up and uh, said, OK, I know what I have to do here. So at halftime, him and uh, Peter Mertesacker, who also became a very key figure in that uh, second part of the season for Arsenal, uh, just came out and, uh, and especially Mikel and started talking. This is not the way. We have to do things better. Nobody else was talking. In fact, Arsene Wenger wasn't talking either, just because he was in a corner, just looking at him and seeing like, yeah, I got a leader here now. Uh, Mikel was a, a little bit shocked that, you know, after having spoken very openly about what had happened, realized that he's just arrived, but also realized that he was listened and that, um, yeah, Arsene Wenger was kind of smiling, thinking we're in good hands. Anyway, many, many more like that. Um, this is it for now. Uh, there will be more next next week. Every time you've got a question, just put the hashtag Ask Guillem and, uh, and I'll try to answer them when we come back next week. Until then.